first of all, welcome everyone. You're in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors, and we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, my name is Erin Willis, and I'm curator of this collection. And this space, if you don't already know about it, is a, a special part of Lincoln City Libraries. We are an um, endowment-funded collection, and uh, the endowment was started by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association. Some of you are members of that organization. And the endowment is what provides um, the funding for this collection. And the NLHA also supports the collection uh, through their dues and through their special programming. And so I just want to thank the NLHA right now for all that they've done for the collection and that they continue to do for the collection. And um, their support is what makes events like this possible. So if we can just thank the NLHA for their work. <laughs> One of the most important functions of the Heritage Room um, is to promote Nebraska authors. We preserve their work in the collection and um, we, we support Nebraska authors in a lot of different ways, but one of the best ways to promote the work of Nebraska authors is uh, by providing a forum for authors to read um, and by allowing authors to connect with their readers. And that is the reason why we have the a John H. Ames Reading Series. This is the 215th event in a, the John H. Ames Reading Series. We've been doing this since 1982 and um, the program has, um, has just grown uh, to include some of the most distinguished Nebraska authors and um, we have a very proud history of hosting Nebraska authors and we have six of probably the most influential nonfiction and poetry writers um, writing in Nebraska and really writing in the world right now and so I'm, I'm just so proud um, that you guys were willing to come and that we can host you for this event. So thank you very much for being here. Um, I'll introduce everyone right now um, so you don't have to hear from me throughout the program. So just I'll do a little brief introduction and then I'll allow each of the authors to say something about themselves and then read from their work. Um, so we'll start with Dr. John Janovey. Uh, Dr. Janovey is a parasitologist. Did I say that right? Parasite. Para <laughs> parasite. <laughs> Parasitologist, <laughs> um, and um, I, I, that implies that you're a, you know you you study parasite ecology. Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, the publication of his book, The Keith County Journal, in 1978, um, established him as one of the best-selling authors in uh, natural history in the United States, and that is the book that's on the Nebraska 150 books list. Many of us read it this year, and it was very very well received by Nebraska. Um, and uh, just as a just as a book. Um, about ecology in general. Uh, this title has been very popular, and, but it's just one of his many titles, and um, his new book uh, will be published by the Center for Great Plains Study this fall, so that's something to look for. Dr. Alan Boyd will be reading just after Dr. Janovey, and he is uh, one of the, the most famous Lincoln authors. Uh, he certainly has uh, the most appeal <laughs> um, to, to a certain group of people in Lincoln. His book, The Guide to the Ghosts of Lincoln, is the most stolen book from Lincoln City Libraries. <laughs> and we, <laughs> we, uh, we keep, um, there are three different editions of the book. We have all of them in the Heritage Room collection, so Dr. Boyd has generated a lot of visitors to the Heritage Room, and um, we're thrilled. To, we're thrilled to have that traffic, but um, that's not his most important work. He, I mean, it really belies how much um, important work he's done um, with his other publications. Um, one of one of the most significant ones is a book called Holding Stone Hands on the Trail of the Cheyenne Exodus, and um, Dr. Boy walked a, a thousand miles. Is that right? A thousand miles miles from Oklahoma to Montana um, on the trail of the ni the 19th century trail of the Cheyenne. And on the way, he kept maps, which you can see here, and um, journals and notebooks of his travels. And that became the material that created the Holding Stone Hands book. And um, he donated that collection to the Heritage Room so um, that researchers um, can come and, and see th the actual raw material from that, uh, from that journey. And um, again, he has several publications uh, that he'll, he'll be talking about as well. Dr. Mary Pfeiffer is here uh, with us today as well. And Mary is an accomplished and widely read author. Her 1994 book, Reviving Ophelia, Saving the, Soul, Saving the Selves of Adolescent Girls, uh, really put her on the map as a major voice in psychology. Uh, she's a major voice in a lot of areas <laughs> right now. Um, she uh, tackles issues such as climate change and immigration. And her book, uh, The Middle of Everywhere, is a book about the settlement of refugee families in Lincoln. And that is the book that's on the Nebraska 150 books list and a very timely book um, that um, 
that is being very widely widely read right now. And Mary also has a book coming out. And um, additionally, she'll be um, doing a new edition of Reviving Ophelia for its 25th anniversary in 2019. So that's something to look for as well. Uh, Barbara Schmitz is with us today as well. Barbara Schmitz is an Omaha native who grew up, um, and I, you might have said this, where the Platte and the Missouri Rivers meet and kiss. And I think that's just a lovely, lovely way of describing it. Um, her poetry is included in the Nebraska Poetry, a sesquicentennial, sesquicentennial anthology. Um, and that was the subject of our, two thousand, or our spring uh, 2017 Ames Reading event. So Barbara's work is included in there. And then also in the uh, smaller, um, fine press version called 10 Nebraska Poets. She has a poem in that book as well. And um, Barbara also has a new book called What Bob Says, and Bob is here with us today <laughs> as well. Her book, um, What Bob Says, was released spring of this year. And um, there's some literature about this, um, that book at the back, and um, Barbara can tell you how to get that book as well. And um, so we welcome Barbara Schmitz. And Bar uh, Pamela Barger, is with us today as well. Pamela is a professional musician. She has been a professional musician since you were 17. Um, and she works with a number of different bands, the Toasted Ponies, the Melody Wranglers, and the Fab Tones. Uh, she is a poet as well as a musician. And um, sometimes her poetry and her music um, combine to, <laughs> to make a beautiful creation. One of her pieces, um, she, uh, she combined her music with poetry um, by Marjorie Sizer, who's with us today. And so um, I just think it's a, I love the collaboration that happens and I'm, I'm thrilled to have you both here. And her, uh, she'll, she's publishing a book soon called Singing Back Up with the Beatles, which is um, uh, a book <laughs> she's working on right now and we'll um, read some excerpts from that. And then finally, we have Dr. Paul Johnsgaard, who is a Nebraska scientist, ornithologist, artist, and a prolific uh, writer, very prolific writer. I asked him at the beginning how many, how many books um, he's written uh, so I could give the accurate number. And he said anywhere between 85 and 96, <laughs> depending, on, you know, depending on whether we're just counting the hardcovers or the e-books. So um, in any case, it's a, a large number of books. And, um, we have an example of these books as well as his artwork here um, and you can see some of his artwork in the back as well it's um, sculpture and drawings and paintings um, and just a, a multi-talented gentleman and his book uh, it's S his 2014 book of essays seasons of the tall of a tall grass prairie a Nebraska year is a book on the Nebraska 150 list and um, its picture is right it's a very beautiful cover uh, cover on that book and um, mr. John's guard you might have heard in the news uh, recently uh, related to the, the pipeline. He's the, the authority on the um, bird migratory patterns and how those are affected by, um, by new developments um, in Nebraska. So um, Mr. Johnsgaard will wrap up the reading and, um, and then we'd like to just save all the questions for the end. So after all the authors have had a chance to read, then we'll, um, whoever's able to stay and whoever has questions will address those at the end. So let's welcome Dr. John Janovey, Dr. Alan Boy, Dr. Mary Pfeiffer, Barbara Schmitz, Pamela Barger, and Dr. Paul Johnsgaard. Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Aaron. It's always a, an honor to be here, and it's really an honor for you all to show up. Um, it, it, it really is. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to read some material from uh, an upcoming book that will be out, I think, in the next uh, four to six months, but, uh, entitled African Notes, Reflections of an Eco-Tourist. Um, this is based on some uh, travels that Karen and I took, and I, before I get started, I probably need to acknowledge some of my uh, readers. Uh, this book's been probably um, reviewed and commented on and edited more heavily and skillfully than any book that I've ever written. Uh, Paul read it. Ted Pardee sitting right there is one of my readers. My wife Karen sitting out there is also a... Um, uh, a really skillful reader. Uh, the, the person who did the heavy duty editing on it is a uh, undergraduate, Nikki Everding, who went through three edits. Uh, she's an English uh, Spanish major, homeschooled. Uh, Nikki was probably as skillful and professional as anybody I've ever worked with in my entire career. Um, her replacement, who is now working in my office, uh, also has been through this book and <laughs> offered comments, uh, as well as a gentleman by the name of Daniel Clausen, who is a, a doctoral student in the English department. 
Uh, Jesse has a cousin who has represented Je uh, Alex Cava, a mystery writer, and there's a book of hers right over here. So she has a cousin who is a bestseller. So the young lady who works in my office as an editor now has a cousin who is a bestseller Nebraska author. So. <clears throat> this is Karen seeing her first wild lion. I've always wanted to go to Africa, Karen explains in one of our gatherings prior to the Botswana adventure. Ever since the fourth grade when we studied geography, I wanted to see the pyramids, the sphinx, all the big animals, elephants, giraffes, zebras, but especially the lions, and meet the Maasai people. Instead of going to Africa and meeting the Maasai, during the ensuing decade, she decorates our downstairs bedroom in African stuff. Masks, baskets, giraffes, zebra switch plates for the lights, puts out of Africa soundtrack on the CD on her stereo, sending that haunting music throughout the house as soft background for our evening lives, and buys tickets to the Lion King stage musical with its mind-blowing puppets when it's performed in Omaha. Then one Sunday in September, she lays a section of the newspaper on our kitchen bar. She's opened it to a story about a trip to the Okavango Delta being organized by John Chapo, director of the Lincoln, Nebraska Children's Zoo. I take the hint and call John immediately, asking him to reserve us two, two places. Now, <clears throat> 62 years after her fourth grade dreams, she's crossing the equator at 540 miles per hour, 35,001 feet above sea level into a 48 mile per hour wind cooled to a negative 54 degrees Fahrenheit heading southeast on her way to Johannesburg in fulfillment of that dream, at least in part. She has no idea of what actually lies ahead beyond a daily malarone pill, an expectation that her previous regimen of shots, yellow fever, typhoid, hepatitis A, tetanus, will protect her from some dread disease a frequent application of insect repellent, unusual foods prepared in unusual places and in unusual ways, an African massage, which is the pounding of her rear end by a Land Rover seat, <laughs> <laughs> and an opportunity to use the binoculars she'd bought expressly for the trip. Leopold Rogue, 8x25 from Shields Sporting Goods, $89.98, hopefully on a lion. She was born in early August under the sign of Leo, according to the tropical zodiac, so as soon as she'd gotten old enough to know about signs, the lion was hers. She'd installed a lion door knocker on her patio door and a concrete lion in her garden. She saved a 1998 calendar, Lions Photography by Franz Lanting from Brown Trout Publishers in San Francisco. At Christmas time, she'd put a red bow on another concrete lion, this one given to her by her children, and now sleeping calmly and sleeping forever on her front porch. Somewhere in her files were all of those New Yorker cartoons featuring lions that I'd dutifully cut out and laid on her desk. One male saying to another one in this circus ring, now remind me, what's so scary about a chair? <laughs> And she sits down at her computer every day, which she turns on only after looking up at the May 1997 Scientific American cover pinned to the wall above her desk featuring a large male lion. The headline on that issue of Scientific American reads, The King of Beasts Masters the Politics of Survival. The story in title is, uh, inside is titled, Divided We Fall, Cooperation Among the Lions. To quote from that article, quote, but lions are supremely adept at doing nothing, unquote. They spend a lot of time sleeping, letting cubs romp around on them, lifting their legs for the young still nursing, and lazily resting their heads once in a while, raising their heads once in a while, presumably for a glance around the bush and a chance to get their pictures taken. But sometime during the week, they'll deal with intruders, sometimes severely, organize cooperative hunting ventures, and kill things typically large animals, including other lions. As is the case with much of nature, the symbolism we impose on various species rarely matches reality. That regal male with his magnificent mane, his way of interrupting his snooze, lifting his head, gazing around his kingdom, lazily scratching that flea bite, then returning to his nap, 
is actually quite dependent on the females to do his family's essential work, killing something for dinner. Or if he's still a relative teenager, he's hanging out with another guy in the bush mall, probably trying to figure out how to pick up some girls and looking around for a wildebeest someone else has already taken down. He's not king of the jungle. He's a great big cat trying to make his way through the complexities of being Panthera Leo in an environment filled with conspecifics living in existing social groups that can be quite defensive toward intruders. Even as we anticipate seeing a lion, the minimum expectation of a lady with a fourth grade dream swirling in her head, we are relatively ignorant of why we might see that individual or why a pride would be camped out in a particular location or what our mental condition might be if two, two weeks hence we still have not encountered at least one lion in the wild and better yet, taken a picture for all to see upon our return to the American Midwest in its dreary February on the verge of turning into an even drearier March. In Botswana, following that day and a half of travel, 17 hours in an airplane seat, subsequent adventures in increasingly smaller aircraft, looking down on a seemingly endless wetland, followed by an hour or so African massage, there damned well better be a line somewhere, and sure enough, there is. <laughs> Chris Naomi, Naomi, our Land Rover driver, is a 28-year-old wizard who can fix his vehicle, often with bare hands, when it fails to start miles out in the bush, reel off scientific names of birds glimpsed on a dead branch half a mile away, identify trees that elephants have dismantled, read hyena demographics and behavior in a line of tracks in a dusty road. As he drives, peering over the right side from his position behind a steering wheel, also mounted on the right, and wears a beautiful leather hat, which he handles with consummate care, placing it carefully on the dashboard when the occasion demands. We hear static Setswana over the radio. Chris punches a button or two, replies into a microphone, then turns to his passengers. Two young males, he says. The look on his face says, hold on. He turns his full attention to the road, which is really not a road at all, but a pair of tire tracks carved into the sandy soil, fairly straight in places, but mostly winding, twisting past termite mounds, past small shrubby trees with leaves held like butterfly wings, through puddles and mud. He turns the wheel sharply left, then right, through underbrush shredded by elephants, branches slap at the canopy, punctuated by more Setswana over the radio. No stopping for photographs, no stopping for distant birds, no worn field guide consultation, and no ecological explanation in his soft, beautifully accented voice. Lions are somewhere ahead. Suddenly, after a couple of miles through the bush, we are upon them. Two young males are lying down right out in the open. One is sleeping, the other one is looking around. There is absolutely no logic whatsoever to their choice of a place to flop. Lions, not visitors to Binoka camp, choose where lions lie down. We pull up behind the other Land Rover. Nobody speaks. Cameras are raised. Karen has seen her lion, her first wild, live lion, lying on the sand, smashing down some weeds in Africa. All things considered, this trip has cost us more than our first house. <laughs> but in this situation, it's not the cost of the young male lion, no, it's his worth to a woman with fourth grade dreams of going to Africa. She sits in silence, staring at the manifestation of that dream lying 30 feet away. Finally, she raises her binoculars. You don't need binocs to see a lion from 30 feet. Instead, you want to see every detail of this animal. Eventually, she slowly takes her camera, an Olympus Stylus 500 I bought her a number of years ago out of her bag, raises it to her eye, starts pressing the button. She's catching that dream. I'm far less enthralled with these two guys enjoying their, enjoying their morning siesta and far more experienced than Karen at trying to deal with wild animals that have no respect whatsoever for your observational desires. My cameras have been out from the moment Chris turned off his engine. 20 profile shots, zooming in to get what I hope is exactly the right expression. A couple of full face views as he turns to gaze at his visitors. Lions are not real, nearly as impressive looking right at you, not nearly as regal as they are in profile. His eyelids are drooping, his mouth relaxed, almost pouty. I work the buttons, zooming in and out, but mostly in. 10 or 15 close-ups of the mane, 
then another 10 really close pictures, individual hairs filling the viewfinder. I focus on the ears, hairs on the fringe, another dozen photographs, scars on the muzzle of that one with his head lying down. He's been in a fight. There's a big scar looking only partially healed on the other one's back leg. I take six pictures of the scar. One front leg is stretched out, paw resting on its side in the sand. I take a dozen pictures of the paw, zooming into the max just to make sure I'm able to remember the dirt and flecks of mud on his toes six months hence. Suddenly there is movement as a butterfly lands on his back. I take 21 pictures of that butterfly <laughs> resting on a lion's back before this little black and white fairy flitters off into an elephant wrecked mopane tree. These long years of being a biologist produce some deeply ingrained habits. Primary one being to capture as many observations as you can while you can because whatever you're looking at, whether it's in the field or under a microscope, won't stay in view for very long. Look at every detail you can see, every hair, <coughs> feather, scale, every nuance of color, every difference between individuals. The other male does not have a scar on his leg. Look at the way his tail is lying there in the sand. Take pictures of that tail. Now take seven or eight pictures of that tuft at the end. I hope the butterfly pictures are in focus. I had to use a digital zoom to get the composition I wanted. Eventually, the lions have had enough of being watched. At least that's our conclusion. They get up and wander off into the vegetation. One appears a few seconds later walking down the road. Chris starts his engine, put the vehicle in gear, and starts following slowly. We take more pictures. By now, Karen is taking pictures too, pictures of her fourth grade dream walking away down a two-track vehicle trail through the Okavango bush. Finally, everyone exhales. We have not really been holding our breath for 15 or 20 minutes. It only seems that way. So. So. Thank you very much. Hi, folks. <clears throat> um, I have to tell you that uh, the very first time I read in this room was uh, shortly after the ghost book came out. And uh, there's a photograph. I, I'm guessing this was the case. But I recall it was, uh, I, and I do have a photograph. Here, here's my mother, I'm at the podium. Here's my mother and four or five of her friends who she has dragged to this reading to hear, <laughs> to hear her son read ghost stories. Uh, <clears throat> and um, I uh, also wanted to say that uh, I'm very much honored to be here uh, with these writers. And it struck me uh, as John was reading that uh, my books are uh, kind of a, a funnel uh, through which the uh, words of these other writers have, have fallen and, and have been condensed. And I recall specifically that both uh, Paul's books and John's uh, I read in preparation for writing uh, uh, Holding Stone Hands, and, and, uh, and they were uh, great influences on me. Uh, I would like to say also that uh, I apologize for anybody who may have come here hoping to hear ghost stories. Uh, <clears throat> in, uh, uh, and I do think that my tombstone will say he wrote that ghost book. Uh, <laughs> but I want to read a, a ghost story of, of a different nature. Uh, and uh, so bear with me while I read this. Uh, it's an essay uh, that I wrote. And it's called <clears throat> The Ghosts in My Father's Tackle Box. It was just after that monumental year of change, 1968, that my father had a stroke and died. He had been at work. After a coffee break, he had stopped by the restroom. The next person in had to throw his entire weight against the door for my father's crumpled body was blocking the entrance. I was 19 and just coming out of the long, blinding fog of adolescence. During that year, I had had only a handful of conversations with my father that did not involve some kind of confrontation. Either I was seeing too many girls or not studying enough. Either I was staying out too late or my hair was too long. After I purchased an army jacket from Goodwill and wore it to march in anti-war protests, I began to argue with the indignant pride of political righteousness. Our arguments usually took the form of an angry exchange of words, 
followed by my father outlining a series of restrictions and my silent vow to break those restrictions in any way possible. <laughs> Our fights were marked by the way he set his jaw in a tight, muscled box, the way he would tip his head and look at me through a furrowed brow and his terse, strained voice. I don't remember the words of those arguments, but I now realize what he was always saying. You are no longer a child, and I must let you go. It hurts me to let you go. It hurts me. For that final year, our relationship followed the same pattern, a series of polite conversations followed by one intensive disagreement. Such was the pattern, that is, except for our game of golf. I've got to pause right here to say this golf course is Pioneer's Park, in case anybody plays golf. <coughs> Such was the pattern, that is, except for our game of golf. <coughs> On the golf course, we seem to set aside our roles and treat one another as equals, or if not equals, at least as wary friends. What are you thinking about doing? He asked me one bright Saturday morning when we had the course to ourselves. Well, I, I think I'll chip it out to that flat area up there and see if I can get a good shot at the green, I said. No. He paused. I mean, what are you thinking about doing after you leave home? The tall grass and weeds of the canyon sheltered insects, and their singing filled the air. He was asking me a question like that during his game of golf, during our game of golf, and his voice carried no threat, only curiosity. And so I answered him truthfully. I want to move to New Mexico. I started pretending to flip through my bag for the correct club. I'm going to move to New Mexico, get some kind of job to support me so that I can write the rest of the time. Yes, he said. Now, my future had been a topic of conversation before, but it had always been in the form of an argument about the value of a good education or my responsibilities to serve in Vietnam. I had never before told him of my dream of a writer's life in Santa Fe. My father waited, and I shot a sputtering hit that was saved only by the grace of a good roll. He stepped up to his ball and swung. It fell to within a few feet of where mine had landed. Oh, I always forget how hard it is to get a good shot from down here, he said. As we walked, he spoke again. You, you might think about finding some career you'd be happy in, he said. <laughs> I was about to tell him that my career meant nothing as long as I could write, but some faraway sadness in his voice made me stop short. You've got to find some things that you are happy doing, he said. He turned his attention to his clubs. Pitching wedge for me here. He pulled the club from the bag and bent over the ball. It was a short chip shot out of the last of the canyon and on to the green. His club slid in a semicircle, a pendulum against the sky. It stopped at the apex, hung there, suspended in time. The metal flashed and the ball floated to a landing inches from the cup. How about forestry? <laughs> I stopped. For forestry? Sure, he said. You like the outdoors. You know a lot about it. A career in something like forestry would keep you doing things that you like, like hiking, being in the wilderness. He paused. Something where you'd be happy. Well, maybe, I heard myself saying. I had never thought of it before and was about to tell him I didn't think forestry was for me. But again, Something in his voice made me stop. I, I always wanted to play baseball, he said, apropos of nothing but the singing of the insects. You, you did? That was news to me. He nodded. Yeah, I, I wanted to play professionally and took it pretty seriously. We were walking up the far end of the canyon toward the green. 
Now the green on this magical hole sat on the edge of the canyon where it rose back up to meet the prairie. It was beautiful, poised between the dark, wild canyon and the endless Nebraska horizon, an emerald oasis that waited peacefully. So why didn't you play? He laughed, his rare, deep-chested laugh. Oh, I was good, he said, but not good enough. I played on a few league teams in northern Iowa before the war, but then the laugh faded and he shrugged. Then the war came, the war came, and that was that. Forestry, or something like that, he said, pulling a club from his bag. It's something to think about. Across the sloping green hill, our eyes met, and for a long time, we embraced with them. It was the beginning of a new relationship between us. Had he lived a little longer until I had grown out of the self-centeredness of youth, I would have come to appreciate his life the way he was appreciating mine. I would have been able to tell him so, as he had just then told me. His death cut short any hope of being able to tell him, but 20 years after his death, while sitting in the cold basement of my boyhood home, I could still learn to value his life. A startling series of apparitions rose suddenly in front of me, and before those ghosts had vanished into vapor, I would learn a final lesson from him. When my mother decided to let us sell her house, the big two-story house that my brothers and I had all been raised in, each of her sons did what we could to sort through the crumbs of 45 years of living. That was how I found myself in the basement with my father's ancient tackle box sitting before me. Now, although we'd gotten a line or two wet over the years, fishing was such an infrequent activity in our family, I had always assumed my father never liked it very much. I had never seen my father touch this tackle box. And in the 20 years since his death, it had been moved from one corner of the big, dank basement to another, collecting such a, sh a thick sheen of dust and spider webs that when I ran my finger across the top, a a gray sheet of the stuff rolled under the tip of my finger like a piece of felt. Even with the dust, cobwebs, and age, the box was still beautiful. The brass corners and wooden pegs that held it together were cool under my thumb. A zigzagging pattern of dark, thin slats worked their way up the side of the box, and a thick wooden handle arched over the top. Looking at it then, I could not understand why my father had painted it black. A small hook held the box closed. I slid it out and folded back the lid. The top shelf held an orderly collection of lures and hooks. Patient wooden fish with rows of hooks instead of dorsal fins gleamed with bright colors as fresh as spring. Near them was a tightly wound spool of dark fishing line. It had a label with a drawing of a fish bursting through the water and in the distance the faint outline of a man on the shore. Now, in the corner of that large shelf, my eye caught on a shred of paper. I pulled it free from a box of small lead weights. It was a fishing license. Lettering edged the faded red paper. The State of Iowa Game Department grants, and here a fat, jolly imitation of my father's controlled left-handed scrawl had written Arthur Boy in big letters, a resident of Osceola County, a license to fish the waters of the State of Iowa for the year 1941. In 1941, my father would have been 21 years old. As I sat there in that dark basement, the bright colors of the lures swam before me. 
I imagined that glorious summer in Iowa long ago. The cornfields green and golden in the powerful sunlight. The streams thick with fish. My father's youth held on the tip of a bamboo pole. By that year's end, he would have enlisted in the army. In another year, he would be fighting in Africa, touring Europe, watching his friends die. My father never talked about his World War II experiences, never. When pressed, my mother hinted vaguely at secret work he had done, at mysterious responsibilities he had had for the army. Now, I sat with the relic of his last youthful summer before me on the floor. Soon after the war, he would be married and raising us. He would never return to Iowa to fish the streams of his endless youth. Now, the careful arrangements of the large collection of lures in the tackle box demonstrated that my father took fishing quite seriously. It was a mild shock to me, since he never indicated that he liked the sport. The tackle box was his alone, opened in the warm and golden moments of long past summers, on the sunlit shores of lakes and on the banks of solitary streams. The tackle box opened like an accordion, one level at a time. And I lifted out the deep top shelf and exposed the space beneath it. There were no more lures, or weights, or even spools of fishing line. There was nothing really except a small brown book of some sort. I was disappointed. Finding that last fishing license of my father had as a boy had sent my imagination racing. Aimlessly, I picked up the book and flipped through the pages, still imagining my father's last perfect summer. The book was a scrapbook of some kind, but the photographs were nearly as small as postage stamps. I squinted at them. One seemed to be a picture of some kind of foundry. Despite the smallness of the photograph, the yawning opening of a kiln of some sort gaped at me. On the opposite page, I recognized my youthful father in a photograph. He was in uniform, unsmiling, standing at a gate of some kind. An hour later, I placed the scrapbook on my mother's lap as she sat in her wheelchair in the nursing home. Can you tell me about this? I asked. I expected there to be as puzzled as I was about the strange book, but she recognized it at once. Oh, she said, art's photographs. You know about these? I, sa I asked. Your father took these during the war, she said when he was on assignment. She slowly lifted the cover and began. My father had grown up speaking German, and since he spoke it so well, she explained, the army began to assign him to special units. Some of his work during the war took him into German territory. After the fall of Berlin, my mother said, her hands resting on the open scrapbook, he was one of the first to be sent into Germany. She paused, her voice straining for control. He was among the first inside Germany, she repeated, the first, the first to see, the first to know about the horrors. This, she said, pointing to the photograph of the kiln, is one of the ovens at Buchenwald. He was one of the first ones to see them. She explained, no one really knew yet. A, a concentration camp? I asked stupidly. My mother nodded. He had been with the group that freed the remaining prisoners. Your dad found the ovens. He was one of the first to see the piles of bones, to see the ashes, to hear the survivors' stories, to... Her hand waved in the air over the tiny photographs. It was as if my father had tried to limit all the horror of the death camp by containing it in these tiny brown images. Where did you find this? She asked. 
She nodded when I told her, as if it made perfectly sense to her that he would put the scrapbook in his fishing tackle box, as if that black box of his youth could contain the phantom of humanity gone mad. All of us are haunted by ghosts, and to try to keep still the fear of their haunting is an endless task. Perhaps our lives are nothing more than a series of exorcisms, a series of delicate dancers with the specters of the past. One day, many years ago, my youngest son had two friends over to play. The three of them were huddled together in the living room floor, designing a complex game involving sticks, paper, rubber bands, and marbles feeling pretty good about myself and trying, as always, to be the perfect father, I crouched down to them. Hi, guys, I said. What you doing? The two friends smiled at me politely, but my son's eyes caught me off guard. They were far more serious than I believed was possible. He spoke to me in an even, calm voice, but with such authority, I was taken aback. Go away, Dad, he said and stared at me. Please, go away, Dad. I paused just an instant and then said a quiet, quick, okay, and left the room. I did what he said, bemused by the serious tone in his voice and a little saddened because I recognized his voice as my own. For a moment, I thought of my own father and then I saw those ghosts again the ghosts that had been hidden away for years that I had found one day in the dark basement of my boyhood home, the ghosts in my father's tackle box. Go away, Dad, my son had said, and I am sure I must have used the same words on my own father time and time again. And now, now it is my turn to dance with the spirits of a glorious youth and the painful passing of time. My own ghosts lie hidden deep within some emerald box of a summer's dream, and they drift echoing across the long golden green of fading fairways. Go away, Dad. Now come back. Go away, Dad. Come back. Go away. Come back. Come back. Thank you. Wow, both of those guys were such good readers. It's the hard acts to follow. <laughs> I thank all of you for being here. I want to say something special about the Heritage Room because I've been coming to these readings for years. Many of the people in this room have read here before. And it's such a wonderful gift to our state that we have a place like this that's archived our Nebraska writers. This room is full of Nebraska writers. And I'm just coming back from a retreat at a ranch called Wish and Jupiter Ranch out in the Sandhills with five other writers. And we talked about writing and writers in our state for the five days. And we all agreed by the end of the retreat that there's no place else we would rather live, that there was no place where there was a better climate for writers than the state of Nebraska. So I'm really honored to be among Nebraska writers and, and reading to Nebraskans in a room that honors Nebraska writers. And thank you, oh my goodness, Anna, hello. I just saw you back there, Pam's daughter. I want to thank Meredith for carrying this heritage room forward, and now Aaron, who arranged our meeting today. I'm going to read uh, just one piece, and it's from a book I'm going to bring out next year with Bloomsbury Press. The book is called Women Rowing North, and it's kind of a bookend book to reviving Ophelia. It's about women in my life stage, which I think, like adolescence, is a much more interesting life stage than the culture suggests. 
and that there's a great deal of unexplored uh, territory to cover. Talking, I turned 70 this month talking about women, say 65 to 75. So that's what my new book's about, Women Roaring North. And I'm going to read you, uh, I tried to wrestle a little bit, I'm a good follow-up for you, because I tried to wrestle a little bit with the poignancy and intensity of this life stage. And as you'll see what happens, I write two paragraphs, and then I just decide to give up and tell the story. So that's what this is. The English language contains the words poignant and bittersweet but it's challenging to find other words to describe the complex emotional states we feel as we run out of time. Our, inexperience, our inner experience is too complicated to label. Without language to express the nuances, we often resort to using single words to describe complex feelings. But emotions frequently occur in combinations such as sorrow and rage anger and fear, or love, sadness, and bitterness, all at the same time. We do not usually feel this or that, but rather both this and that, and three other emotions as well. I felt such a library of feelings when an old friend from Scotland visited us in the summer of 2016. When I say we, I mean my husband Jim and I in this piece. We first met Frank when he came to Nebraska in 1974 to participate in a symposium at the university where my husband and I were graduate students. We had offered to host a foreign visitor. Frank was scheduled to stay with us only three nights, but we enjoyed each other so much he changed his flight and stayed 10 days. He was only 10 years older than Jim and I, but he had written textbooks and established himself as a leader in European clinical psychology. Frank had a much bigger grasp of world history, politics, and geography than we did. He held strong and well-reasoned opinions on everything, clinical psychology, governance in the UK, capitalism, European politics, and the nature of the human race. He was fiercely proud of his country and his clan history. He knew a great deal about America's history and government, and he expressed strong views about our country's role in the world. When we met Frank, he was a mountain climber and a member of the Scottish Mountain Rescue Team. He had a thick Scottish accent, curly black hair, and a sturdy build. He wore the same color slacks and shirt, blue and blue for 42 years. I've never seen him in any other outfit. <laughs> Frank is married to a psychologist like himself. Every year we take turns, cross, every other year we take turns crossing the pond. We know Frank's children and grandchildren, and they know ours. We regard each other as the Scottish and Nebraska branches of the same family. Traditionally, we have hiked and backpacked in the Rocky Mountains and Scotland. Scottish Highlands together. We've had uproarious times around campfires and wilderness areas and mountain meadows. One time I remember laughing so hard around the campfire that I said, if we're not happy now, what on earth could make us happy? Mm -hmm. Now Frank is almost late 80 and last year he had a stroke. When Frank got off the plane this year, he announced it was his farewell visit to Nebraska. As they walked toward us, Francis held his hand to steady him. The travel had been arduous and painful, but except for his walking and difficulty with balance, Frank was the same. His intellect, sense of humor, and kindness remained intact. This trip, there would be no hiking. However, we engaged in many of our traditional activities. For nights in a row, we watched the moon rise over Holmes Lake. We savored long, slow meals and read together around our fireplace. We drank coffee in the mornings and talked and talked and talked about changes in our personal lives and the political landscape. We punctuated everything with laughter. Our conversations were those of people who had known each other for decades, and we ranged freely across time and space as we shared our emotions without hesitation. 
Frank and I spoke about his impending death. I read him Robert Frost's Death of a Hired Man. His favorite lines were, home is the place where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Or in the same poem, home is defined as something you somehow haven't to deserve. Both Frank and I find great comfort in poetry. In fact, poetry is the only form of language that it can express the complexity and depth of our emotions. Over the weekend, we watched my six-year-old grandson play soccer. Frank promised him tickets to the Manchester United game if he could come soon. Francis' brother works for Man U, and she offered to send t-shirts and other team swag. We visited my son's farm near Central City for a big meal. Frank told my three grandchildren about his experiences as a child in Scotland during the war. He recalled when his uncles were called to war and, one of them, and when one of them was killed. He'd been a boy during the bombing and the starvation rations. Frank became acquainted with our two-year-old grandson, Otis, whom he never met. Otis immediately loved Frank and held his hand when he needed a guide. He sat on his lap and even fed him from his own spoon. Frank dutifully ate whatever Otis put in his mouth, even though Otis clearly had a bad cold. <laughs> because we knew this was Frank's last visit, everything was poignant. As we watched the bird at our feeder or shared pie and coffee after a meal, I was aware how finite our time together was. At one time, it seemed as if we would cross the pond and see each other forever. But now forever was over. There was this sadness. Losing Frank would be like losing a chunk of our being. But there was also a sweetness, the sweetness of appreciating everything in the moment for just what it was. The last morning, Frank told us that being with our five grandchildren made him optimistic that our country and our good lives in Nebraska would continue far into the future. We watched the hummingbirds one last time. We took every possible variety of group photo and then rode silently to the airport. Ordinary conversations seemed banal, and yet the truth was too complicated to voice. At the airport, I gave Frank a book of collected poems by Robert Frost. He stuffed it in his rucksack. We hugged goodbye in silence. We looked into each other's eyes and communicated our love and our knowledge that from now on, any goodbye could be the last. Thank you, that's it. a bunch of writers to follow. <laughs> this is a great program, and I'm very honored to be here in the Heritage Room. I thought I might read the little poem that got into the Denise Brady's hand letter press for the 150th poetry anthology. It's called Supper. I'm making a tuna casserole, adding white and green noodles, to water boiling in a cast iron pan. He's fixing the broken boards and the fence. Our son's off playing. I resist the urge to go to the back door, storm glass still on, and wave a movie wave across the greening grass, across the theater, across eternity. All the couples forever and ever, amen. Repeating this scene, wearing these costumes, complete with opposite sets of genitals, as if they were real and we existed, he and I, in this time, this old house, supper almost ready. My next poem is kind of a, a longish one, and um, I too am lucky enough to get to go to a writing retreat. We have it four times a year on the um, Platte River. And I think Lucy, are you back there? Lucy comes up with prompts for us. And I think we said for this one, let's write about the year we were born. 
October 1945. The war is over and Johnny comes marching home and a sailor bends a woman backward in a kiss that goes on forever. Confetti falls from heaven. Soldiers troop into VFWs across America trying to wash away horror scenes, guns and wounds with sloshing beer and tight lips. The medicine doesn't work so good. Rosie the Riveter closes the door on the munitions plant, opens her kitchen door, oven door, back to her position, cookies and ironing. A new generation comes boom booming out of the hospital, cascading waves across the landscape. Those who will learn not to trust anybody over 30, to make love, not war, to give peace a chance. These hot rod kids who grew up under the mushroom cloud, who practiced hiding under their schoolroom desk, whose neighbors build shelters under the ground, stocking them with canned goods and water, who had at first to be careful in swimming pools in summer, but whipped that old cripple polio and grew up to hitchhike like Kerouac and Cassidy on their own roads across America, who tripped other ways too into surreal dreams and scenes, dripping with colorful skirts and fringe vests, beads, and headbands, Jimi Hendrix wah wah screeching allegiance to America. America, we questioned, what are you doing, killing people in their own civil war? We disagreed about the dominoes falling. We wanted to talk about love and sex, and aren't we all brothers and sisters, and isn't love free, and Shouldn't we taste it all with everybody? Hats and gloves came off in churches. Folks decided to sit in the sunlight or go surfing instead of sit in pews. And women went out of the kitchen again to law school, med school, to become bosses and companies. My mother, still canning green beans and trying not to have people notice her. God came back to life. Charlie Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate committed their slaughter before Charlie Manson's insane orgy of killing. America puffed up big with money. Blacks sat on the bus, stood up to oppression, and marched with interlocked arms. It was all blowing in the wind. Great ones blown away too soon out of their stories. While I tried in my pink bedroom to worm my way into this big movie through books stacked up from the library, not knowing there was someone glistening and funny on his way to walk with me. So a little history lesson for those of you who weren't there, and I see a lot of you probably were there. <laughs> and this one is uh, called Just Outside. Just outside, joy has come to live in their house. Oh, heart, 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 oh, bleeding drops of red. Joy is standing on the red porch under the golden roof next to Grandpa's green porch swing, softly singing, then more loud. All this time they thought it was the cars and trucks sighing and whizzing along the highway river, but it was joy humming, drawing close, pressing its nose up against the window, waiting. They didn't know it was joy just outside the door, they thought it was the dogs barking, lawnmower chirping happily as it chomped down its weekly large meal of grass. They didn't know Joy didn't know how to read and write. They thought maybe it was a secret passage in another language 
inside a book, hidden on an upstairs shelf. They didn't know joy was an easy recipe in an open cookbook on the wooden kitchen table. She didn't need a new stove after all. It wasn't necessary to preheat the oven. No assembly needed. All they had to do was tug at the bow, pull the colored paper off. There stood Joy, all shining like the Christmas child. I belong to you, Joy said. I am yours. All you have to do is open your arms, reach out, relax. Let's tell each other a story about how happiness has come to town. Hitched a ride with Joy. Joy is, so to speak, her boy. Oh, let them in. Let them begin. It's been a long time coming. It'll be a long time gone. Okay, this new book that's coming out is um, a revised edition of what Bob said, and it has 20 new poems plus some drawings by artist Michael Lynch. So I'll read you one poem from the old book. And this came out at the, also at the cabin retreat. I wrote it, and Shelley Clark said, oh, that's a wonderful poem. And I said, no, it's not anything. And then everybody kept saying, do some more, do some more. And so I have the book because of those writers and them telling me to do more. It's called What Bob Says. Bob said, everybody in my family chewed with their mouths open. Bob said, my mother locked up the food. Bob told my mother she looked like olive oil. She didn't like that. When we are fighting, Bob says, you are just like your mother. Everybody in your family, he says, thinks they are always right. That's because, I say, we are usually right. <laughs> See what I mean, he says? Bob would agree, argue with my mother about music. He would insist that she didn't like music. She would say she did. The little white radio sang on a wooden shelf my father made in the knotty pine kitchen he built for her remodeling our old house, finishing the kitchen in time for her birthday. I just don't like loud music, she'd say, as she washed the supper dishes to pop tunes and cooked Sunday dinner to polkas. When she was dying, she asked for Christian music. The nuns in their white habits fluttered around like confused turtle doves. Well, some music, I repeated. This is a nursing home where people die. You must have some. No one's ever asked, they responded. But still they scurried. They found a heavenly tape with an angelic voice lilting, come to me. My mother smiled, took a breath, and floated away. Bob said, I guess she did like music. <laughs> so I'll do, um, this will be the middle, one poem will be the middle section of the Bob book, and it's about this couple that's had this conversation over and over and over and over. The conversation. Pleasure, he says, crossed armed, not budging. Meaning, she answers, leaning in, enlightenment, God. This is God's body, he answers. Angel, angel, she chants, flapping 12-foot wings. Life is short, he reminds, not so much breath now. That's why we must, we must, she sputters. Relax, he says. Oh, really, she replies, have some fun. Fun, she fumes, this is serious. He reaches into his sack of candy, throwing her a chocolate kiss. I just wish, she says. What, he asks, 
that it would all mean something. He turns his bag of treats inside out. This is all there is. Okay, and then I'll end with what I always like to read something new. We've had a lot of uh, surgeries and hospitalizations this spring and summer. And this one's called Sundown at Faith Regional. <laughs> <laughs> the setting sun pulls the old women out from inside the hospital into the parking lot. One crowned in frightened white hair, another slowly moving with a walker. Evening is descending, and like the whirling grackles squawking and settling in the healing garden trees where a lotus rises from the pond, the women head for their vehicles, wanting to make it home before dark arrives, leaving their old bird men murmuring and moaning here in their beds behind. Thank you. Wow, I'm really honored to be here. Honored to be among you wonderful writers and wonderful writing friends, family, students, parents of students who once were students. <laughs> um, so I'll just echo everybody's thanks. Um, I've been lucky in my life to have been able to work at things that um, suit me. And teaching piano is one of those things. And we've got a couple students here, current students, three. One in her 70s and two, 12 and under maybe? How old are you, Mara? 10 and under. Um, this one's about a violin recital instead of a piano recital, but it, it's an attempt to show and to understand for me what it is about teaching music that I like so much. Violin recital. His scabby elbows poke from a red t-shirt tucked into khaki shorts, red band-aids on each knee. You couldn't say he's playing in tune, but he's trying. In the second row, mom's shoulders rise, pulling that F sharp up a little. Grandpa nods, thinking about football. Little brother kneels in his seat, grinning at the nice lady behind them. You couldn't call this art, not yet, but let's call it beautiful. Every morning before school, the velvet-lined case splayed open on the couch, the little fellow bowing away, eyes slightly crossed, listening hard, coming closer, closer, ever closer. I'll be reading about music, and I'm trying not to make this, use terms that aren't understandable or anything. This will sound like it's about music, but really it's about bathtubs and uh, <laughs> aesthetics in life. Uh, but if you're familiar with Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata, it starts with a big fat mm, C minor chord. Da -da, da -da, da. That's the music I had in mind as I began this, but it's called Thrust. You give the next chord a gentle push, not too loud, not too soft, exactly, almost too late, helping it elbow its way into what the previous silence assumed to be conclusive. But instead, this F major climbing to this G minor and then this spray of 32nd notes leading to a red toy boat in the bath, the hand's intuition that one no more can allow torpor than can one force momentum. Not in water, not in sonority. No, the best thrust will come from the gentlest of urgings. In this way, a whole bathtub and a whole sonata traversed. <laughs> This 
poem, singing back up with the Beatles. <laughs> Mom, I guess you get to find out some, some things that I didn't tell you back then. <laughs> Wasn't naughty. Um, this begins with an epigraph from a Lennon and McCartney song called I Am the Walrus. And I have to sing it. Yellow matter custard dripping from a dead dog's eye. That's the epigraph. <laughs> Singing back up with the Beatles. It was for my fire, for the way I let the music move me, for the way I sang with guts and power, not even trying or wanting to sound pretty. I am the Eggman. They are the Eggman. I am the walrus. Cuckoo, could you? Wearing my lavender skirt and sweater outfit, I practiced along with my image in the mirror, but only when I was alone. It was too soon to let mom and dad know I'd be going soon. <laughs> Strawberry fields forever. The end. <laughs> In the beginning. In the beginning, in the silent dark, there only was peace. Perhaps it was a lonely peace, no separate thing to embrace any other separate thing. And if someone had been there to opine, she might have called such a state boring. The mystery is how some foreign particle inside it, that first itch, that before time could be named, sneezed us into rocks and water, grass, trilobites, warthogs, tubas, cherry tomatoes, and encyclopedia. And then we just got busy aggregating and falling apart like there was no tomorrow. Always yearning in our most mineral recesses to find our way home. Thanks to Juanita for finding that. I'd forgotten I'd written it. She sent it to me and said, read this. <laughs> oh, I wrote that. <laughs> um, that poem and this one are basically about questions that have, I, I can't remember not having the question about how am I inside myself? How am I here? What came before? Uh, what is consciousness? Um, the title is Adagio, which in Italian and in music terms means slow at leisure. Um, does anybody know what a ground bass pattern is? Is anyone familiar with Paco Bell's canon? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I had a student, a little girl come in, she was all excited because she learned about this new kind of music called a bomb that has the same part that just goes over and over. I figured out it was a cannon. <laughs> <laughs> so a ground bass is a cannon. It's, a, it's, it's the same pattern that, that the piece of music is composed above. So is this dum, 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 dum. Hit throw jack, ground bass. Adagio is a shorter poem than the introduction. <laughs> what bed's stream could run more deep than the heart's beat, its steady thrum slowly filling the echoed silence, drawing you into time, kindling the ground bass from whence music will rise to form your incipient, inevitable life. <laughs> One thing that's been wonderful about listening to the readings so far is that I keep hearing little echoes in what I have to read. And this, as I've gotten older and more aware of the passage of time, I think I've gotten a little better at noticing joy, noticing the happy things and the small things. And there's no shortage. And this is so true of parenting. And my wonderful daughter, Anna, is here. This is about her, my specific life with her when she was little, whose childhood I really loved and appreciated, but now I look back and see how much more I could have appreciated. I bet a lot of parents feel that way. It's called Days So Ordinary. 
You take this little noiki and you squack it like this, she said. <laughs> she was playing in dirt with a twig and a pop top and she wouldn't be quiet. I wanted to write in my journal, deep thoughts. <laughs> Finally wrote one line, hers. You take this little noiki and you squack it like this. <laughs> Her bedroom then, Wonder Woman on the wall, muscled arm thrust skyward. The bed, stone blocks, plywood, foam, spread with strawberry shortcake. The dresser cost $5 at a garage sale. Wooden blocks for building. In a toy crib, two naked dolls, my friend Mandy and Candlehead. <laughs> Fisher Price record player, soundtrack to Annie. Tomorrow, tomorrow, I love you, tomorrow. While I made a casserole, she made a passenger. You take a little plastic dish and add onion skins and potato peels. I liked to sip Jim Beam before bedtime while we colored together. Airplane with a steering wheel, skeleton with the light inside a beautiful brown rainbow. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, I got to play with a band, Sour Mash, that uh, toured and did road trips and made music with lifelong friends, made a lot of noise. Um, the speaker stacks were probably to the ceiling and this wide, and my ears would be ringing four hours after gigs. I think I still hear okay, it's <laughs> amazing. Jim maybe hasn't had that luck. Um, I'm still lucky, I can get my fix with the loudest band that I play in, the Fab Tones. This is called Take a Walk on the Wild Side. Maybe it's the margaritas that make this seem your real life. The one to which you finally returned after a long, ridiculous dream. Peeing in the bar bathroom, your ears ringing from the last set, you realize you can't wait to get back, to re-fall into singing, to let your voice, loosened of worries, moorings, follow the stream of rhythm and noise and song and friends, to let it go, and make whatever music we happen to make. Go, darling, go. Be delighted, if not brilliant. Take a walk on the wild side. Take all the chances you choose. Get lost. Haven't you always found your way home? Thank you. For this last one, I, I, I'm glad that I got some nature in. I'm a big fan of being outside and playing with plants and things. And this came from uh, uh, my dog and I like to walk uh, Roper Park along a stream in the mornings. This one's called Nothing Harmed. <coughs> His pointy black snoot parts the morning air and opens a space for the plume of his tail. And then my toes, first this foot, then the other, like maybe the way the duck's webbed foot parts the creek, a beautiful V of royal opening behind and closing back in. I like to imagine that something of ourselves wafts in our wakes, then gently re-enters the world, which nods and goes about its mysterious business of being the world. I'm not going to read all of them. <laughs> I'm not going to read any of them. <laughs> I'm going to take the prerogative of age, of age and uh, talk about, to some extent, them and to some extent, maybe Nebraska. Speaking of love of this place, I think I first came to the Heritage Room in 1965 to give them a copy, to give it a copy of my first book. And since then, I've done that with every book, with uh, a bunch of drawings and carvings and prints and original manuscripts. 
So this actually is the place that has the only complete collection of my work, <laughs> other than at home. And it's a great honor to have done that. Uh, as I say, I'm going to talk a little bit retrospectively. I came to Nebraska in 1961 after having been in England two years on postdoc fellowships. I'd never been to Nebraska. I'd barely heard of it. I'd certainly not heard of the Cornhuskers. If I'd heard of them, I might not have come. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, I showed up quite naively. And I had been told by, by my Cornell professor when I said I was applying for this job, he said, well, it's, it's a good place to look for another job from. <laughs> Cornell and the Ivy League have different attitudes. Anyhow, uh, I fell in love with the place. I originally had come with the thought I'd move on. But within a year, I decided Nebraska is where I wanted to spend my life. And one of the reasons that I did so was that the first spring I was here, spring of 62, I'd heard from my only graduate student that there were reputedly sandhill cranes out on the Platte River. I was teaching ornithology. So I thought, well, I'll take the class out and see if we can find any. I, I'd never seen a wild sandhill crane, never seen a wild crane of any kind. So we went out, uh, there was no Highway 80 at that time, we took back roads, went to Grand Island area, and there were no cranes, went on to the next couple of little towns, there were no cranes, and I thought, my goodness, I've been misled. So I turned the car south, crossed the Platte River, long wooden bridge at that time, and suddenly there were cranes everywhere. There were cranes everywhere. I was astounded. There was almost no record in the literature of concentrations of cranes in the Platte. Some notes back in the 30s. And cranes went from a bird I'd never heard of, or barely, to the one that would probably come to dominate my life for the next 50 years. And so uh, my life has to a large extent revolved around cranes. Before that, I was perhaps insanely interested in waterfowl. That's what took me to England to study the behavior of 120 species of waterfowl. There are 140 or so in the family. And I went to a place called the Wildfowl Trust, which had the biggest collection ever of the ducks, geese, and swans of the world collected by a, a famous uh, English painter, uh, Peter Scott, the son of Robert Falcon Scott, and who uh, was wealthy enough, so he had gathered together, partly for his own amusement, but mostly for educational purposes, all of the waterfowl that he could lay his hands on, live waterfowl. I'd heard about it as a grad student, and actually, rather impudently, wrote to him, said, someday I'm going to come to England, I want to study your crane, your waterfowl. And he wrote back very kindly, he said, well, if you can find the money, uh, you're welcome. So the last year of graduate school, I started applying for postdocs, and I applied for two, thinking with a lot of luck I might get one. And as a matter of fact, I got both of them, so <laughs> I was able to delay the starting of one for a year. And that gave me two years to do nothing but look at ducks, geese, and swans and start raising a family. But the ducks, geese, and swans, <laughs> <laughs> that was important. And I decided I was going to write a book. I thought if I can write one book in my lifetime, that would be something. <laughs> So I, I wrote basically a, a uh, detailed description of the behavior of 120-odd species of waterfowl. And where did I put it? <laughs> Actually, oh, here it is. It's at the bottom. It was published. Uh, I got to Lincoln, as I say, in 61. It took uh, four years to go through the publication 
process, uh, published at Cornell. Nowadays, I spend about a month writing a book, and I'm annoyed it takes that long. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, uh, it was published late in the year of 1961, 1965, excuse me. And at that time, we had a little faculty club on campus. It was a chance to get to meet some of the other faculty members, one of whom I met and who fascinated me was a guy by the name of Bruce Nichol. He was the second director of the University of Nebraska Press, then a very small press. Uh, he was a wonderful raconteur. He'd tell stories of Lincoln and all over America, especially New York that he'd been to, knew all the famous writers. So I sat there, listened to him, hardly said a word. Then when, one day, a couple of weeks before Christmas, he came into the faculty club, waving a copy of the New York Times, stomped over to me and said, God damn it, John's guard, what's the big idea? And I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, you went and published a book and didn't tell me about it. <laughs> and I said, well, it's a book about ducks and such. I didn't think you'd be interested in it. He said, I decide what I'm interested in. <laughs> he said, now you've got to write one for me. I said, well, you know, I'm working on teaching and studying and researching. I said, I don't have time, but I did write another book when I was in England, but it's no good. He said, well, what do you mean it's no good? I said, well, I just didn't think it was very good, not very saleable. He said, well, that's my job. I'll take it. take it. Luckily, I had the manuscript in my office, so we wandered over to the office, and I gave him a copy of the thing. Next day, he said, yeah, we've got to publish this. I said, I, I don't know. Maybe if you put in some of my drawings and photographs, it might be okay. So he agreed to include, I think, 60 color plates. So it came out. It was called Waterfather Biology and Natural History, and within Three or four months it had won three awards. It was named one of the 100 best science books of the year. It was put in the libraries of all the, it was an association of English speaking peoples and one or two other awards. I thought, my God, if, if it's that easy to write books, I might as well condemn you. <laughs> so, so I started work on two or three other books and <laughs> it became a habit. <laughs> And one of the books that I wrote early on, it came out in, I think, 1991, was based on what I'd learned about sandhill cranes. After 62, I went out every spring, both with my class and especially on my own watching cranes and photographing them and writing about them. In fact, I'd written a book on the cranes of the world in the late, uh, uh, in the late 60s. And this book, I, uh, I wanted to write something that a child could read, and yet I wanted it to have biology in it, I wanted it to have American history in it, I wanted it to have some aspects of historical culture, and I wanted it to cover a long time span, 120 odd years maybe, and no crane lives to 120 years. I had wanted to have a crane. Cranes do live up to the 70s, believe it or not. There's a, I knew a crane, if you will, a Siberian <laughs> crane, who died when he was 77, very happily, because he was with two other female Siberian cranes. He was the only male crane on the block. <laughs> and he was still producing semen at age 76 or 77. Anyway. I, I was up at our lake cottage in Minnesota thinking, how can I write a book about cranes that covers the period from the intrusion of whites into the Great Plains, the 1840s, 1850s, right up to that time, 1950s, 1960s. How can I talk about Eskimos and Native Americans and myself? I wanted to somehow incorporate myself into it and the, as much ecology as I could. And so I thought, it's, it's impossible. And then I thought, well, 
it doesn't have to be a single crane. It can be a crane at different times in American history. And I mean, so I thought 1840, 1880, 1920 or whatever, 1940. So very soon I had four periods of time, four cranes, four areas, the breeding grounds up in Alaska, the fall migration route in North Dakota where I was a kid, the uh, wintering grounds in uh, New Mexico, the major wintering grounds, and then the Platte Valley for the spring migration. And then I thought, well, I can have an Eskimo boy. I can have, in a sense, myself for the youngster in North Dakota. I can have a, a Pueblo Indian boy or girl uh, in New Mexico and a young, basically a, uh, a young immigrant child living on the Platte Valley in the early 1840s. So it all fell together. Within 10 minutes, I knew exactly how I was going to write the book. But I had to be back in Lincoln by the end of the week because I was going out to the field station that weekend, and I thought I had to write the damn thing before I went out there. <laughs> so I, uh, I wrote a chapter a day for four days, and uh, then packed up and came back to Lincoln and repacked and went out to Cedar Point. Did the drawings for it out there. And not really having published a book with a truly commercial publisher, uh, Cornell was, a, of course, an academic pr publisher, and, and I was dealing with uh, two or three other publishers. So anyway, I just decided, well, I'll, I'll send it off to St. Martin's Press. This was before John started publishing with St. Martin's Press. But I'd read that they were interested in nature. And I didn't have an agent. I still don't have an agent. Um, anyway, amazingly enough, they read it and said, sure, we we'll take it. And so, again, I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> I, that was first draft. I just sort of sent in a, basically a first draft. Uh, so it came out, and it's been in print ever since. In fact, the most recent edition just appeared in September of this year with the University of Nebraska Press. So I became addicted to writing and uh, doing the necessary drawings and photographies and so on. And it's been uh, a consuming activity for my life. And it's also been the greatest adventures of my life. Uh, working down the Andes from Colombia all the way to southern Chile, the outback of Australia, uh, Mexico, Arctic Canada, Arctic Alaska. It's been great times, sometimes dangerous times, but I wouldn't have traded them for anything. So uh, uh, I would guess maybe some of you wonder why I do it. Well, in the early books, I thought I'd make a lot of money in royalties. That didn't turn out to be the case. <laughs> but it becomes a compulsion. And for better or worse, it does leave a kind of a repository of, of information about the two groups of birds that I most enjoy. And. Then it also uh, forced me to think, what else can I write about? I wrote five books on cranes and three or four on waterfowl. So I just started thinking about other kinds of birds. So I ended up writing about groups of birds like bustards and quetzals. I decide where I wanted to go in the world and <laughs> think of a bird that lived there. <laughs> and then justify a trip. So this is how I got to see all these, these wonderful places and wonderful birds. Um, I don't think I'll do any reading. As I say, I'm not a very good reader. And uh, c compared to the people who have, who have read, uh, I'm simply not that good. Uh, in any case, it's been an honor to be here. I think I may not have used all my time, but. I know that Aaron wanted to be out of here by <laughs> a reasonable hour. So thank you very, very much.
It's a great honor for me to be here. Thank you.